My name's Howard Diner. Um, I come from the United States, if you didn't guess. Uh, I live uh, right outside of New York. My offices are in um, Redmond, Seattle, you know, where Microsoft is like right down the road. Uh, we also have a great office here in Bengaluru. And um, welcome. So, I'm going to talk this afternoon about um, a particular tool. And I wonder if we raise our hands, how many people know about mutation testing? and a tool called PIT. Wow, OK. Um, let's get started with this, because it's going to be pretty brief. Right? I want to start by talking about this fella. Okay? His name is Dijkstra. Okay? Um, he was a professor, a big per person back in the early days. And he made a really great comment back in uh, 1988. And what he was talking about was the complexity of development. Now, back then, he was saying, you know, people that are programmers have to go from like bits, you know, to megabytes, you know, a microsecond to a half an hour. He was talking about a complexity of things about, you know, one to 10 to the ninth. Now, I've done a little extrapolation, and since computers are about a thousand times more powerful than the which is approximately the number of neurons in your brain. Okay, um, is this, is, it'll come up, okay. I'm gonna keep going. Although it would be nice to have the projector at this point. Um, there's a cost of defect that are out there, okay. There was a study done in 2013 by Cambridge University. They put the cost of fixing defects at about 312 billion, with a B, dollars annually. They also said that developers spend approximately 50% of their time finding and fixing bugs. And I looked up that number, okay, $312 billion. And in terms of gross domestic product GDP, that would put software defects ahead of countries of their total GDP, um, countries like Israel, Hong Kong, Egypt, and the Philippines. So we're talking huge numbers. And the problem is that that number, that $312 billion, doesn't even include the biggest cost of defects, right? It's not in the direct remediation of those defects, but there are much larger problems like reputation loss. So I'm going to play a little uh, video. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this out here. It was made by IBM probably about 15 years ago. It talks about how do you fix defects. Sir Arthur, a giant sloth, has attacked our service up at Slough, bringing great unrest to the customer base. Consultant Ned, what do you advise? You must build a giant catapult to fire the greatest of projectiles at the sloth. What kind of projectile? Are you suggesting we throw money at the problem? Precisely. And thus, Sir Arthur saw the need for IBM consultants, who actually are accountable for results. Well, aside from the plug from IBM, that's usually the way that we approach problems. We throw money at it. We throw people at it. Right? And wouldn't it be great if we could save all of that, that cost? So how do we go about fixing all this stuff? Well, the first thing about it is that when we develop software, we call ourselves software engineers, right? Is that what everybody usually refers themselves as? The, oops. the problem is that the stuff that we design is like, well, it's kind of better than nothing, or it's better than the stuff we had before, right? But if we were a structural engineer, and we built a bridge, and the bridge fell down, people wouldn't think very much of us. Or how about a guy that designs, um, a plane, the avionics on a plane, and you're at 35,000 feet and cruising, and all of a sudden, all the avionics go out. Okay? Would the, you know, this, the engineer that designed that panel kind of like say, oh, oh well, it happens. <laughs> yeah? If we want to mature as an industry, we've got to figure out better ways to deal with this stuff and adopt a zero tolerance policy. So, one of the ways to do that, of course, is to find defects early. 
right? Even large defects, if we can fix them quick enough, the costs are usually really low, right? There's not all those kind of indirect costs, and we don't have people that are really upset at us, right? Um, little defects, though, that escape into the wild can be company killers. Okay, we have to avoid that kind of stuff. So it really comes down to turning testing, turning development on its head. All right, we used to have a pyramid, and at the bottom of the pyramid, we'd have things like analysis and design. We work our way up and do some coding, and then we do some testing. And as everybody knows, the right way to do things nowadays is to start with test, write code to make the test pass, and then refactor, which is actually analysis and design. Right? So that's extreme programming. Okay? And um, when we get to really extreme programming with true unit tests, truly decoupled, right, where we can run our tests thousands and thousands in a second, we can start to look at how we can get better at writing better code. However, test-driven development is only necessary. It's not sufficient for quality in code. Okay, and the problem with it is that there's four things that keep us from using TDD to its fullest all the time. Right? The first is I like to say that TDD is like being on a diet. You know it's good for you. You know you have to do that, but wow, it's so easy not to, right? You also have managers that are out there that are pushing people to say, look, just get it done. Just write it. And then they kind of do what I call code and pray, right? They put the code out there and pray nothing happens. It's bad, right? It's also really hard to do test-driven development when you're talking about dependencies, the evil dependencies and finding out how we can uh, mock and, and fake our way around that stuff can be difficult at times. Finally, there's the problem of legacy code. Right? Has anybody in this room not had problems with legacy code in their, in their lives? Right? The problem with legacy code is you can't just go and put new unit tests inside of it. Okay? It takes so much refactoring that many times it's more expensive to take the legacy code and go back and unit test it than it is to write it again. And the problem, of course, is that it's a risky proposition. You got code that kind of works, right? It's better than nothing. So maybe we'll just continue with it. <laughs> so many managers kind of like to hedge their bets. They'll say, you know what? Do some unit tests. Get me test coverage that's 100%. Then they feel kind of confident that they can go forward and not have problems in production. However, that's kind of a misplaced confidence. And we'll talk about why in a second. All right? But if test coverage isn't the right way to tell that you have enough unit tests to give you real confidence, then what is? So I want you to imagine that you have your, your code written, you have real unit tests going, you run coverage, your cover, favorite coverage tool, and shows 100%. And then somebody's leaning over your shoulder. And they say to you, OK, this is great. You got great code. Would you mind if I messed with it a little bit? Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to not tell you what I did, but I'm going to take some of your conditionals and maybe reverse them. Or I'll take a random you know, void method call that you have and take it out. Right? And if your code coverage runs the same, right? you don't have some kind of unit test failing, then there's something wrong with your unit test. You didn't catch the fact that I messed with your code and you got different answers. That's mutation testing. Okay? What we do is we want to scale that up. Instead of having one person leading over your code, we want that army of mutants to come in and mess with it all over the place. Okay? So, let me first talk about test coverage, and how test coverage is really, in my opinion, a management report. And to do that, we're going to see a little code. So the code we're going to write is something I call bar world. And bar world is going to take people that come into a bar, and they have like a cover charge. Right? You know, you have to pay so much money to enter. Okay, I want to make sure you got that. <laughs> you never know. 
And uh, there'll be three categories of people. There will be women, and there'll be two categories of women. Women over 35, well, pay one price. Women under, I think, over 21, they get in for free. And men, they got to pay. They got to pay $30 a person. Let's see this code, right? I'm first going to define an interface for a person. The only thing that comes out of that interface is something that gets a cover charge. I'm going to then implement this, OK, um, and define a person factory, a factory method for a person. Right? It's going to look at their gender and their age. If they're male, big M, right? then we're going to return a person male. Otherwise, we return either a person female or a person female young. If none of that happens, then we tell them, send them home. Okay? You come in, person female, that implements our person. It extends the person factory, right? Um, we, have, we call the super for it. A regular woman pays 10 bucks. Not a bad deal. If you happen to be younger, right, and you're over 21, I guess, you don't pay anything. And guys, 30 dot belly up. Okay, so that's our stuff. Um, I'm going to then write some unit tests. This is really simple code, right? Well, I'm not doing a test driven development, but I am writing the unit test for it, all right? I test my rules, make sure that all my rules fire. Men, 35, they got to pay 30, $10 for a woman who's 37, nothing for a woman who's 22. I test that I can throw the exception with a woman who's trying to enter at 18. No, you got to go home, right? When the coverage is 100%. Pretty good. So now we take this and we give it to our DevOps people, probably is the word for today. Right? Um, I'm going to simulate what would happen okay, with this particular main, okay, where I'm going to have a male who's 45, that should be 30 bucks. A female who's 37, that should be 10. Female who's 33, that should be 10. Male 30, that should be 30. Two young women come in. We don't do anything for them. Uh, we then iterate over that um, collection that we have. Uh, we, we count the number of men and women, the amount that we uh, collected. We print it all out at the end. Looks pretty reasonable, right? Well, no, uh, train wreck. <laughs> OK. Uh, when we run this code, it comes back and tells us that we don't have any men that we have six women, and that we collected $30. They were 100% coverage, for God's sakes. What went wrong? Yeah, OK, you got it, OK. <laughs> we, and you're not even a mutant, OK? But like I say, it's very easy to make a mistake. OK, so we're going to look and, and get into that. What I do want to say, though, is that Test, cover, uh, test coverage is not the same as quality. And I think it has to do with how we get mesmerized by that particular metric. Right? It's very simple to capture it. Right? It's not a bad one. Okay? But test coverage only tells us the code that we didn't test. We happen to run through every statement in our unit test, 100% coverage. Right? But that's kind of a shallow compliment when it comes to quality. And it's easy to game, right? If you want to impress your manager, and they, de they demand that you have 100% coverage, go into JUnit, write a big old integration test that tests every kind of feature you can think of. At the end, say assert true, true. You run the thing, boom, high coverage rates, right? Metrics are supposed to start a conversation. They're not supposed to be everything. And when we stare at those metrics in the big fancy dashboards and look at them, right, we get overconfident that things are all fine. Okay? How many tests do we need? Well, if you look at uh, Martin Fowler, he'll tell you if you rarely get bugs in production, you're fine. He expects like 80 or 90 percent. Here's some of the mutants that you'll find. I'm not going to go through these in depth. All right, there's a whole bunch of them. Okay, there's stuff that takes boundaries on conditionals, negates conditionals, 
removes them completely, right? um, takes out a return of an object, returns a null, right? um, stuff that uh, takes out a, a void call, okay, so there's, there's side effects going on, right? uh, changes around iterators, uh, incrementers. Here's the whole list. Great. Let's see how that really works, though. Okay, so here's a demonstration of some code. Okay, happens to be for quicksort. Okay, let's work through a not so trivial example. Um, a quicksort. Um, found this code at, uh, it's kind of nice code actually, at mycstutorials.com uh, for quicksort. And it's the traditional CS101 variety of quicksort. All right, put into Java. Um, you know, we're going to be sorting an array. This is going to be an integer array. It doesn't really matter for us right now. Um, you'll see the standard sort of pivot points, standard sort of recursion stuff going on, swap area over here. Um, wrote a test for it. Okay, we're going to sort the first nine digits of pi, uh, which just so happened to be the first nine digits, uh, which is kind of interesting. All right, so the first thing that we want to do, of course, is to make sure um, that our test runs. Do that. Run this as a J unit. Voila, our test runs. Let's check the coverage now of this code. Okay, so we're going to use the standard Eclipse plugin for code coverage. And we're going to run it uh, through J unit. We can actually test what this is looking at. Um, when I'm doing the coverage, I'm only doing the source. All right, so let's go ahead and run that. Our tests still work. Of course, our coverage is 100%. All right, so everything inside of our code has been tested, more or less. Um, now, let's run pit against this and see if there's actually some code sitting out here which could cause us some problems in the future. Of course, those yellow areas are pretty sub... sub uh, going to see something with that. So we're going to run this again as a pit, pit mutation. I've installed the pit clips uh, plugin for that. Um, so as you're seeing, um, it's taking the bytecode uh, that's been out there for our, um, that we got during our testing, um, running mutations against it. You know, there's a lot of mutations that it doesn't have to test. Um, you know, it starts finding some and testing them out. That timeout will occur when a mutation takes place and it's making the thing run forever, so it cuts it off after a certain amount of time, which is, you know, resettable. Um, it's running through this stuff. Norm you know, naturally, this is taking a lot longer. Uh, because of the output and because of all the code that's being tested. All right, so let's wait another couple of seconds for it. Still running. And uh, we finally uh, come out there. We can actually see uh, that uh, what's happened with this. Let's take a look at the summary first. Now, interestingly, right, all of our line coverage that we got you know, it's 100%. That's the way that PIT's supposed to be. We only have one class. Okay, so inside that class, we only have one method. Now we start looking at the method. Now, even though the code, right, had 100% line coverage, you know, um, you know, these lines in here were tested. They were run through. Um, not every condition on them was run, of course. So one of the things that we're seeing, right, is that um, when the conditional boundary on this while loop was changed, um, you know, changed from a, a greater than to a, a, to a greater than and equal, timed out, right? Never could complete. Um, that's not so terrible. We start seeing, though, other things inside here. Here, conditional boundaries were changed, um, and because this is fairly complex, you know, we'd have to look and see which ones were changed. And uh, we got a problem. All right, there are some things that didn't change in the output, meaning that our test didn't catch everything. All right, so not enough tests involved. The code still may be right, you know, but our tests were inconclusive. Um, 
This was a different one where uh, there was a different uh, conditional boundary that was changed. All right. We get a list of all these things inside here, line numbers and what was going on inside of it. So um, as you can see, this code, which is really quite good code, right? There's really nothing particularly wrong with this. It's right by the book. Um, gives us some pause, right? And, you know, naturally this area in here, um, we're pretty sure that it works, right? It's been written a lot before. But um, do we want to test it, you know, so that we're in, in sure that it's going to work correctly all the time. All right, we want to make sure our bridge doesn't collapse. Now, I did the same thing for J unit for the sake of staying in this time box. I'm going to skip over it. Um, I took the current um, head from the, the from GitHub for J unit, ran stuff. There's a lot of things that are exposed. Okay, but we're going to skip over that. Let me get to the conclusion here. Okay, uh, first of all, writing code is hard. Right, you have to always challenge that hypothesis. It's science, right? That as we modify the code, everything still works, and our assumptions are still true, right? Unit testing is really the the tool of choice for writing high quality code, but it's hard, like being in a sweet shop when you're on a diet, or having a manager that wants us to code and pray, or having nasty legacy code, right? We ultimately have to ask ourselves. How many tests do we really need? And it's hard to answer, right? If our code never fails in production, there's a good chance we actually don't need more unit tests. Okay, and that's actually a, not a bad thing to think about. But if our code hasn't been released yet, we want some indication that it's gonna stay good, we might wanna think about getting past just 100% coverage. Because 100% coverage does not mean quality. It doesn't mean good code. Right, it only shows us that there was no code that wasn't tested at all. To do that, you need that mutant army. You need a tool like PIT. PIT isn't really uh, perfect, especially for trivial products. It can take a lot of time to run. It presumes that you already have 100% coverage. It can give you false positives, right? And also, it'll tell you where the problem is, but it doesn't write the test that fixes it, okay? Um, you know, I want to think of tests as the practice that we do when our code is really run, right? It's like figuring out how to get to Carnegie Hall, right? You have to practice. <laughs> Hey, do you know how to get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, man. Practice. <laughs> the old ones are the best ones. Anyhow, I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'll be around. There are some questions, answers. We're going to debate and we're going to depart. Link me in. I'm always happy to, to engage with people. And thank you very much. Right. It's possible. I don't know of any tool that's done stuff for JavaScript. Uh, but uh, something like the uh, rapid application development where we uh, do testing for the line coverage. Yeah. And we do for the branches and yeah. then the functional. Right. I'm, I'm aware of that, you know, inside of like Jasmine, you can go yeah. through and get, you know, coverage data. That's a step in the right direction, but it's not mutation testing. You could write a tool that does it, right? Okay. These are the same. Uh, mutation testing actually isn't anything new, right? It, it was a, a doctoral thesis back in the 80s, okay? But it's just been too hard for people to go through and actually make the tools. So there's tools for Java PIT, which actually stands for Parallel Integration Testing, which is where it started. And then they said, hey, this is really cool for this other stuff. So right. they named it, kept it with PIT. That exists. There's some stuff for CLR languages that exist. Um, Microsoft is actually big into something called PEX, right, which is actually going to not only do mutation testing, but give you unit tests that now exercise that mutation. But for JavaScript, I know of nothing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sir? Yes. It, well, well, PIT will work with you know, uh, uh, Java bytecode. 
Okay, and the reason they want to work with bytecode is they don't want to have to recompile everything. It's a very CPU intensive thing. So they can look at the bytecode and then figure out if this is a boundary and then what can we do about this. Same thing with, with the CLRs and, and PECs and stuff. Right, but it, it brings you back into the source. Yeah. Anything else? Let's go have some coffee.